Welcome everyone. Would you stand and join with us as we sing?
Well, good morning, and we just want to say welcome home to each one of you. This is a beautiful place to call home. If you're joining us from online, welcome our home into your home, okay? What we're going to do is have you have a seat for just a moment. I believe that Romans and, and Ephesians and several places in the Bible, it's very, very clear that giving honor where honor is due is downright scriptural and biblical. So this morning we want to pause and give honor where honor is due. See, we came here this morning and none of you had to worry about your life being threatened. We can sit in here and worship and celebrate and give glory to God and do it in a free country with the freedom to be able to do this. So right now, if you are a veteran, we're going to ask you to stand right where you're at. Let's uh, let's bring the lights up. Veterans, will you please stand in the back? We back. Yes. Thank you. Stay standing. Stay standing. So we're going to ask you to stay standing for just a moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the work that you've done. Now, as they remain standing. We're going to go into our meet and greet moment. And those of you who are nearby, these individuals who are standing, please go over and introduce yourself to them and thank them for their service. So I'm going to have everybody stand up now a moment. Go introduce yourself. Meet somebody you don't know. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. we're going to ask you to start making it back to your seats. Not only is this a welcoming church, this is an inviting church. And so thank you for loving and caring for each other. We want you to be known here and we want to love you really well because that's what we do in our homes. So I'm going to ask the, uh, the ushers to come down right now. They're going to hand out the registers. The registers is a way for us to get to know you because we love you because we care about you. And, and so we're gonna ask you to take that register, fill it out. Let us know who you are. If this is your first time here, please don't be intimidated by it, but do take that moment to fill it out. Let us know who you are. And we love to pray here. Persistent prayer is one of our pillars, one of our values. And so on the bottom is an opportunity for you to fill out a prayer request. Let us know the joy, the celebration the deep concern that you might, ha might have. We want to celebrate with you. We want to weep with you. So let us know how we can do either or maybe both of those alongside of you. And one of the members of our household lives thousands and thousands of miles away. Global witness is a huge value of ours. And so we're gonna watch a video here this morning from Micah and Melissa. And they're gonna give you some prayer requests also. And we'll pray for Micah and Melissa and their ministry after the video. But sit back and let's watch this video together. Hi, Southwest Community Church. We are the Wards. I'm Melissa. This is Micah, Joanna, and Lydia. For those of you we know, hello. For those of you we have yet had the privilege to meet, we're excited to one day be able to meet you in person. We are global workers supported by Southwest Community Church, and we live and work in Indonesia. Right now our access is language learning, and we have lived here just under one year. We've been blessed with a really good language school that has allowed us to progress steadily, and we've even gotten to the point where Micah has been able to preach two times in Indonesian. Our hearts break for those who have yet to hear the good news of Christ. And because of that, we will be living and working amongst a people group that are unreached. Once we have finished our language school here in the city that we currently live in, we will move and live amongst that people group and we will study their language as well. While we can't share everything on a video like this, we would love for you to go and ask anyone on the GO team for more specific questions. They'll either be able to answer them or they can connect you with us. They would also be able to give your input to us if you'd like to receive our updates. 
In terms of family news, we welcome the newest member of our family on Tuesday, October 25th. Both of our daughters, Joanna and Lydia, have been doing extremely well with the different transitions that they have faced. And Joanna has made close friends here in our neighborhood. In terms of prayer requests, we would love to put three things before you. First, for the continued health of our family, especially with a newborn. Second, please pray for the spe several specific people that we are engaging with right now. We've had the opportunity to share the gospel and read scripture with several different people, and we would ask prayer for those people. Lastly, we would like to ask prayer for our newest teammates, the Slaters, who many of you know. They are newly arrived, and pray that we will be able to help them settle in well to their time in this city, language learning. We're so grateful for you. We're so grateful for the partnership that we have with you. We praise God for you. What a treat it is to see what God is doing in all areas of the world, right? And, yeah, and, and you guys have a huge, huge piece in that. So as they've asked, let's join in prayer with them. Father God, thank you for Mike and Melissa and the work that you've called them to do. And even though we can't be where they are, we can support them from afar. Support them obviously financially, but support them more importantly by prayer and just covering them in prayer. So Lord, thank you for Micah. Thanks for Melissa, Joanna, little Lydia. Lord, keep them healthy. Keep them strong. Give them endurance and perseverance to continue to do your work where they are at. And as Garrett and Maggie, we said goodbye to them a couple months ago on young little Byron, and they join up, Lord, may you just work mightily through them, that they are your vessels doing your work, and that lives are being transformed because they are preaching the gospel in the native language. And what a treat that is. So Lord, the individuals that they are interacting with and sharing the gospel with, you know who they are. May. Uh, May they speak clearly to them in their native language. May they speak boldly to them in that language. And may your Holy Spirit work in the lives of others to transform their hearts. Let their hearts be soft and receptive to the word of God. And Lord, as they team up with Garrett and Maggie, Lord, it's just so great that they have each other, that community that comes and was birthed out of this community and what a treat that is. So Lord, we just give our global workers and the work that they are doing wherever they are at to you that they feel a special closeness to you. We pray in your name, amen. Please stand as we continue to worship.
Like I said last week, uh, 85% of people who go to church on Sunday do not open their Bibles the rest of the week. So I think there's power in reading God's word. There's power in it coming out of our mouths uh, together. So this month is a month of Thanksgiving. So we are reading together Psalm 111. So we'll put it on the screen and uh, I will read uh, the regular text and then the underlying text. Please join me uh, as we read God's word together. So it says, praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright and in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Join me. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the inheritance of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have good understanding. His praise endures forever. Let's pray. God, thank you that you are God of redemption. Thank you that you are God that sees us and knows us and all of our flaws, all of our sins, and all of our ugliness, and you still love us. So much that you sent your son as that substitutionary death on the cross for our sins. So today we gather as a family. We not only come home to church, but we come home to you for we know our true home is in you and in you alone. So God, I want to pray for everyone in this room that your word today would come alive in them. Those of us in the room that need your love and your comfort, God, love us, protect us with your word. Comfort us. For those of us in the room that maybe need conviction or prodding, or motivation to move towards something, God, we pray for your conviction on our souls that we align our lives with your word. And God, I pray that you would anoint my words, that they would not be my words, but that I'd just be your vessel and you would use me to to highlight your word today. So my prayer as always is that everything that is done in this place at this time would ultimately bring you glory and honor. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, thanks for coming out today. Glad you are at church. If you are new here, I'm glad you're here. I am new as well. This is my second week uh, here at uh, Southwest Community Church. No, really, you don't need to clap for that. (laughs) Wow, see see how fast it goes from honeymoon to like nobody cares anymore. Yeah. Uh, my, my wife is with me today. Maybe you can clap for her. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I am joking, but I did wear Bronco colors just like, I don't know anymore if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Like, like I want to support the home team, but um, boy, it's rough. It's rough out there. Uh, So anyway, I'm glad to be here, uh, and I'm glad uh, that you're here, uh, that you're here to worship. Just a couple of highlights. We do have these invite cards, so as you are talking to your neighbors or your friends, people that you know, please have these in your back pocket, have them in your car. I carry them with me all the time. Just a good way to invite people as you're talking about the church, which I hope you are. Um, Just a good way to say, hey, come visit us. Uh, Service times are on the back, and there's a QR code that will take them directly to our website. So that's a resource. And then also, hopefully you were handed this on the way in. It's uh, what we call our sermon guide. There are announcements uh, on the front for current things that are happening this week. There's a lot going on at this church. Uh, You can always go to our website and see, uh, but that's on the front. And then on the back are message notes. So if you want to track, if you want to play fill in the blank, uh, you can do that. And all the passages that are mentioned today are listed there. You can take those home to reread, to think about. If you don't have one of these and want one of 
of these. You can just put your hand uh, up. We have uh, people that will uh, bring you uh, one of those. And here's the cool thing. I tried it this week. There's a QR code on this uh, on this. Uh, card where we take messages. If you have your device, your phone, just click on that and that will take you to an electronic way uh, to take notes. Um, and like I said, I tried it this week. The blanks are there electronically. If, that, if, that is you, if that's you and you want to do that electronically, please click on that QR code and you can do it electronically. And here's what's fun about this. And I really did try it. With the blanks, I tried to put in the wrong word. Guess what? It'll flash, it'll turn red, and then it'll give you the right word to put in. So you can't even mess it up if you're, if you're online, if you're doing it electronically. I love that. And there's also another box that you can click on that and write your own notes. So if you don't like mine, you can make up your own. Um, so we're an all-service church here. So anyway, uh, use that. Uh, hopefully it edifies you, builds you up throughout the week as you take notes. So for those of you that are with us, you know we're walking through the Gospel of Luke. We're learning about the life of Jesus, learning everything that he has said, he has taught, uh, and as he walks through, and, uh, and know that today is no different. We're going to go into Luke. If you have your device or your Bible, you can go to Luke chapter 20. We're continuing to look at the life of Jesus. And remember, we're calling this Luke, good news for everyone. But like I said last week, it's not just good news. See, to know that there's a God that loves me in spite of my sin, in spite of my shortcomings, in spite of, of my ugliness, and loves me enough to send his son Jesus to die that substitutionary death isn't just good news, it's the best news on the planet. And so if you are a believer this morning, if you are an authentic Christ follower, you know what I'm talking about. God has saved you. God has pulled you from yourself, pulled you from a life of destruction, and I would say an eternity of destruction, and has called you now his son and his daughter. So it's not just good news, it's the best news. So we pick it up in Luke 20. Here again, today, we're going to see another religious group trying to stop Jesus. So if, if you're following the life of Jesus, he's slowly gaining popularity. But as he does, there's these religious people out there that want to squash him. They, they, want, to, they want to downplay his message. They, they want to end his message, end his life, and just call it quits. And today is another group we're going to see that attempt to trip Jesus up with a trick question. And if you've been with us for any amount of time, you know that this is going to be the third question from a group that says, hey, we want to test Jesus. We want to see if we can trip him up so that we can either have the authorities arrest him or even put him to death. So follow along. We're in Luke 20, 27 through 40. Here's the story. And before we go to the story, if we have parents in the room, you may have to do some work with your kids this week because this is, this is one of those stories that just kind of out there a little bit for our culture, okay? So, so I'm warning everybody right now. We teach through the Bible. We don't ignore it. We don't skip passages. This is one of those this week that I went, boy, I'd like to skip this because it's a little, a little strange here, which you'll see here in a minute why, why I'm saying that. There came to him some Sadducees. Here's our group, those who deny that there's a resurrection, and they asked him a question saying, teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, having a wife but no children, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring from his brother. Now, there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and died without children, and the second and the third took her, and likewise all seven left no children and then died. See how it gets a little awkward real quick? Okay, I guess I just think it's awkward. Anyway, um, <laughs> afterward, uh, the woman also died in the resurrection. Therefore, here's their question. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will she be? For seven had her as as wife, and Jesus said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given to marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given to marriage, for they cannot die anymore because they are equal to angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now he is not God of dead, but of 
the living, for all live to him. Then some of the Pharisees answered, teacher, you have spoken well, for they no longer dared to ask him any questions. So there, there it is. There's our passage, right? Big chunk. Jesus has a lot to say. And so before we launch off, just understand this. Today, we're going to get an eternal perspective on marriage, an eternal perspective really on life. And Jesus wants us to grab hold of those things. It's a great story in the life of Jesus. But here's, here's the deal. Jesus handles opposition with grace and with love and with patience. So before I dig into this passage, and I'm just going to walk you right through the passage, and we're going to look at some very good stuff here Jesus has as he gives us an internal perspective. But before we do that, let me just give you a brief little lesson. And the lesson is, is this. If Jesus can handle opposition with grace, love, and patience, how are we to handle opposition? With love, grace, and patience. Right? We, we should handle that. And, and for those of you that don't know, you and I now live in a world and in a country and in a society that Christianity is not super popular anymore. Right? We live in a day and age and a time where Christianity, especially in the U.S., is becoming less and less and less. And other beliefs, false beliefs, are gaining ground all around us. Right? So if you haven't taken any opposition as a Christ follower, you will. Maybe you're not in the right place. Maybe you're not saying enough to take opposition, but know that it's around us. And there's one in particular group in our country that's gaining ground. The percentage goes up year after year after year. Do you know who it is? What, do you know the belief system? And again, you can talk. This is a two-way street. Yeah, I heard in Islam, I heard something else. Atheism. Yeah, those of you that say atheism are really close. The group that's growing the fastest are called the nuns. Now, not the Catholic nuns, we're, we're not talking about those nuns. It's, it's really the nun groups. It's the individuals that say this, I don't adhere to any religious belief. They're really known as the nuns. See, according to Pew Research Center, this group known as the nuns really refers to those who self-identify either as atheists, in other words, there is no God, or agnostics, which say, we don't know if there's a God and we can't figure it out. Or they simply say, you know what, I, out of all the religions, I am going to be nothing in particular. Now, here's what's striking about this. Understand that in 2012, 23% of our nation claim to be a nun, right? Like, like we're, just, we're just not going to believe in anything. We're not going to talk about anything. And, and understand this. Those who claim to be nuns, they claim to be nuns because they want to avoid the conversation. I don't know if you've spent time with many non-believers. I've spent the last three years on a large college campus and people just don't want to engage in the conversation. And they just kind of say, you know what? I'm a nun. You do you. I'll do me and we'll just kind of live happily ever after, right? Or like I said a couple of weeks ago or when I candidated, a lot of people take, take their life as an empty basket and they'll say, well, I like this belief about new age and I'll put that in my basket. I like a little bit of Christianity and I'll put that in my basket. And, and Buddha has some good things to say and so I'll put that in my basket. And they're walking around with this basket of potpourri beliefs and they just kind of make up their own as they go. Right, And so our world, our culture, our society, especially our col college campuses are saying, you know what, either I'm going to walk around with my bowl of potpourri or I'm going to walk around with an empty bowl and I'm going to be a nun. Not going to believe in anything. So in 2012, 23% of the U.S. population claimed to be a nun. In 2021, that number grew to 29%. Here's the starking thing. Our millennials... And our IGNs, that college campus, guess where they are? Their number's at 35%. So the younger our culture gets, the younger our nation gets, the more further away from Christianity we, we become. So what do we learn? What's the encouragement? What's, what's the challenge? Because guess what? Christianity is not dead and it will not be dead, right? Because we serve the king. And the king has already conquered death and hell for all of eternity. So Christianity is going to march on. Actually, Jesus tells us, I will build my church and not even the gates of Hades will prevent it from going on. So I, th I think what we can learn from Jesus is this. Engage in the non-believing culture, but do it well. Do it with wisdom, grace, and love. 
I would say this, maybe love first, speak second. Build a relationship first, get to know that person first, get to know whether they're walking around with kind of a false pulpery basket or if they're walking around with nothing and then just have some real conversations with them. Just get to know them. Speak truth and love, but love first before you speak. So let's go back to our passage, right? So that's, that's just kind of the, the precursor to our passage. Let's love like Jesus loves, right? Let's talk like Jesus talked. So now let's get to our passage. First of all, we see a group who denies the resurrection. They're called the Sadducees. We see it in our passage. This group is the Sadducees. Not only they do not deny the resurrection, they would also believe this. There is no life after death. Have you ever met one of these individuals? I have. I've had these conversations where they'll just say, you know what? There's no life after death. You Christians are crazy. There, there's no life after death. It's just this. It's this life. And when you die, it's lights out. We're done. So as we look at scripture, know that it's super relevant today. A lot of people think the Bible is a history book that, that you know, you could only relate to if you lived when Jesus did. Not the case. There are people today that say, you know what? We don't believe in the resurrection. We don't believe in life after death. That's what these Sadducees believe. And today, our passage is one of those synoptic gospels. So we see the story in, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. That's what it means to be in the synoptic gospels. But in this account only, and in this gospel only, does D Jesus take a direct hit from this group. In other words, right here, he is confronted by them face to face, literally. Now, they were a small group of individuals. They were very wealthy, very powerful. At that time and at that period, they were known as the high priest at this period. And them and their families belonged to this little group called Sadducees. But again, just like I said last week, they saw themselves as spiritually elite. We know better. We know it's true. We know it's right, especially when it comes to this little carpenter from Nazareth. Well, that's the group. Their spiritual elite, they knew and loved the books of Moses, which is the first five books of the Bible, for those of you that don't know. But even though they knew those books, they didn't believe in the resurrection, and they didn't believe in life after death. Look at Acts 23. It gives us a little, little insight to their mindset. It says this, for the Sadducees, this is the group we're talking about, say that there is no resurrection, there's no angels, and there's no spirit. But the Pharisees acknowledged them all. So in Acts, we see a little difference between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But the point is this, that these people didn't believe in any life after death. They didn't even believe in angels. They didn't believe in the spirit. And so this is the group that we're talking about. And it's good for us to understand their mindset, their mentality. What do they believe? Because if this is where they're coming from, that's their context. This is where I'm coming from. And now we're going to confront Jesus. Knowing that this is who we are, we're the spiritual elite, we know the first five books of the Bible, we know Moses' law really, really well, and now we're going to use that and we're going to come confront Jesus, which brings me, kind of there's a second point, which is we see a trick question about resurrection and marriage. They want to trick him. They want, they want to trip him up. They want to show that Jesus is flawed, that his teaching isn't true, that Christianity is a hoax. So they come to Jesus and they say, you know, we're spiritual elite. We know the Old Testament. And look at this. Here, here's their trick question. Luke 20, 28 through 33. And they asked him a question, said, teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, having a wife, but no children, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first took the wife, died without children. Then the second, then the third, third took her. And likewise, all seven left no children and died. Afterwards, a woman died. So here's their question. So they play this scenario and they say, here's a question in the resurrection. Therefore, whose wife will she be? For she had seven, right? Seven brothers. Now, I don't know about you, but this is a, a, a mind blowing scenario. In this church, I have met several widows, several of them. I have not once found one that said, well, you know, I am a widow, but after that I married, you know, my husband's brother's brother, and then 
that didn't go so well, so then I married the second one, third one, right? The, the, the scenario is unheard of, right? It's unheard of. In our day and age, we don't really understand, and, and, and if you think that these guys are just making it up, they're not making it up. They went to the Old Testament, which they knew because they were masters of the Old Testament. They went to Deuteronomy. So look at this. Here it is in Deuteronomy. I'll, I'll show you the law. Five through six says, if brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And the first son whom she bears shall succeed to the name of his dead brother that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. So, so in the Old Testament law, so, so in that scenario, the whole goal was keep the name alive, right? Keep that family name alive and do whatever it takes to keep that name alive. Even if, if the man dies, then go to the husband so that you can keep the name alive. And now, and now I'm not going to get into the weeds on this, but I encourage you, if this interests you, go to Deuteron Deuteronomy 25 this afternoon and read what comes afterwards. Because what comes afterwards is, what if a dude refuses to marry the wife that comes to him, right? What, what if the brother does and gives a whole list of other crazy stuff? So for your entertainment this afternoon, <laughs> instead of watching football, go to Deuteronomy 25. Um, here's here's what's really going on here. These men wanted to trip Jesus up. They knew the Old Testament. And so they play this outlandish scenario of these seven brothers and one woman. You can almost hear the smugness in their attitude, can't you? So Jesus, if there is a, rection, uh, is, is a resurrection like you claim there is, if there really is life after death, if there is this so-called resurrection, then whose wife will this woman be because she had all seven? See, these Sadducees create this outlandish scenario to try to trip Jesus up. And Jesus gives some life-altering words. He actually gives some words of eternity. But before we get there, I want you to look briefly at the parallel passages to Matthew and Luke because he kind of calls them out. So even though Jesus is loving and gracious with these individuals, he also calls out the truth. So look at Matthew 22, 29 says, but Jesus answered them, you are wrong because you know neither the scripture nor the power of God. Mark 12, 24, he says the same thing. Jesus said to them, is this not the reason you're wrong? Because you know neither scripture nor the power of God. Think about that phrase just for a moment. Jesus calls them out and says, A, you're wrong, right? So whatever belief system you're holding on to, you don't get it, and you don't get it for two reasons. Number one, you really don't know the scripture that you claim to know, because if you knew the scripture, you would know the very power of God, because that is a direct correlation. The more time we spend in God's word, the more time we know God, the more we recognize him and see him for the omniscient, all-powerful God that he really is to the place where we can't ignore that and we just bow the knee to our sovereign Lord. And Jesus calls him out right away. He says, you're wrong. Not only do you not know the scriptures, you don't know the power behind the scriptures, which is God himself. So maybe this morning we need to ask ourselves some simple questions. Do we know the Bible? Now I know there's some intellects in the room that'll be like, well, yes. I know the Bible. I have several degrees that prove I know the Bible. Good, but do you know the God of the Bible? And do you know the power of God of the Bible? And do you experience his power on a daily basis? Because see, if you don't, I would say you're like the Sadducee. Maybe doing a lot of learning, you, you maybe have some stuff memorized, but God's not alive and well in your life. So what's it for? And Jesus is about ready to, to, to come to the heart of the very issue and say, you know what? Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship with a living God through his son, Jesus Christ. And it's the most powerful news ever. And he also reminds us that, that he's the living God and he's not a dead God. 
which means he's not dead in the world and he's not dead in our own lives. Let me say it this way, death has no hold in God's kingdom. It just doesn't. We're about ready to see it through the words of Jesus. But he says, death has no hold in God's kingdom. Which brings me to this, and I know some of you have been waiting for this, an internal perspective on marriage and eternity. <laughs> what does Jesus say about marriage? And what does he say about having a perspective of eternity? How can I live my life with an internal perspective? So in this unlikely scenario, Jesus gives the truth. With wisdom and patience and love, he says, guys, let, let me share a little reality with you. And, I, and I'm just going to point out four things and then we're going to be done. Number one, marriage is earthly and temporary. That's what Jesus says. Look at 34 and 35. Jesus said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given to marriage. In other words, those of us that live on the planet, those of us that are right here, right now, we marry or are given to marriage. But those, get this, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. I love what Jesus does here. He upholds and honors the sacredness of marriage. In other words, he says this, there are people like you and I that are going to live on this planet and we're going to be married individuals. So, because it's a two-way street, all married people, raise your hand. Go ahead. Well, I'm proud. Yeah, yeah, there's a two-way, good, good. Put them down. All those of you that are happily married, go ahead and raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, the hand better go up. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, we do have uh, biblical marriage counseling in the back for those of you that will need it after the service. Here's the reality. Jesus says this. We live in the here and now, so we're going to be married and we're going to be given to marriage. And those of you that are married, let me give you a little hint. Your marriage exists not for each other. Your marriage exists to glorify God. Don't miss that point in your marriage. And I know we have some really strong marriages in this room, but always ask yourself, does my marriage glorify God? Or am I individually glorifying God in and through my marriage? I, I, I think it's an honest and a good question. So Jesus says this. Marriage is good and it's from God and it's one of the gifts designed by God. But he also says, but it's temporary. It's temporary. It's not going to last for eternity. Right? And so all these songs that say, oh, eternal love and my eternal flame and all, all of this stuff, those are good sentiments and they're fun to listen to, but they're absolutely wrong. Because Jesus says marriage is a temporary thing. It's an earthly thing. It's for the here and now. He says this. He says the sons of this age, they'll marry and are given to marriage, but there's another age coming. And don't miss his words, because this is very important. He says, those who are worthy to attain to that age, you know what age he's talking about? He's talking about the age to come. He's talking about eternal life. For those who are worthy to have eternal life, in other words, the true church, the ones that have been called by God, saved absolutely, we, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the true church, he says this. He says, there's an age to come. And they will experience a resurrection from the dead and they will have life after death. That's every authentic believer on the planet. Very, every authentic believer in this room. See, these are the saved people. These are the true church. And he says this, although you may be married here on this earth, when we get to heaven, when we see God in all of his glory, that wonderful human relationship no longer exists as a marriage. Will we know those people? I believe we will. I believe there's enough scripture to support that we will be reunited with our loved ones and we will know them. But my lovely wife and I will not be married. And it doesn't matter because I'm married to Christ and she's married to Christ and we will have eternity with our Lord and Savior. Thought number two that Jesus gives us, he says, not only is marriage earthly and temporary. You know, before we get to number two, let me say something to the single people in the room. For those of you that are single, 
For those of you that dream, hope, pray for the one, right? And, and you can't wait for that to happen. That's good. Keep moving that direction. It's a gift from God. But guess what? That individual will not satisfy you. They will fail you. If you want to know more of your sin and more of your shortcomings, get married. <laughs> because you walk around with a mirror all the time. And those of you, see, the only ones that are laughing in the room are the married ones, right? Because they know, yep, that's exactly right. But, but let me just say this to, to you single folks. Love God first and trust him with the rest. And if he gives you that wonderful gift of a marriage, live it in a way that honors him. Protect it, love it, cherish it the way God intended it to be. Point number two, uh, we are sons of God. We're sons of God. Verse 36 says this, For they cannot die anymore because they are equal to angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. Who are the they? Well, the they goes back to the people of of the new age, right? Or not the new age, but the age to come. In other words, the authentic believer, the true church, the true sons and daughters of God. And he says this, he says, they cannot die anymore. See, for the true believer this morning, we're not afraid of death. Scripture even says, death, where's your victory? Oh, death, where's your sting? It, it's nowhere for the believer because we know we're going to live for eternity with our heavenly father. That this life on this planet is temporary. We are literally sons of the most high God. So when God enters a life, his spirit indwells us, we cannot die. And, and Luke goes on to say that we're even equal to angels. Well, I don't know how much you know about angels, but angels are immortal beings. So if angels are immortal and we're in, equal to angels, then that makes us immortal. We're sons of the living God, sons of the resurrection. We're raised from the dead because our sin-sick soul has been awakened by him. Look at 1 Peter. I, I love these words of 1 Peter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Here it is, from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Do you see the powerful words of Peter? He says, because of God's mercy, we're born again. And not only are we born again, but we're born to a living hope, an eternal hope. And then look at the joy in the verse. He says, if, if that weren't enough, and it is enough, he said, we also have an inheritance. We're going to receive an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. That's for every believer. We're part of God's family. And that should bring us joy. Okay, some of you need to put the joy back on your face because I'm not picking up a lot of it in this room. Right? See, when God saves us for all of eternity, he, don't, he not only just saves us, it's, it's not an insurance policy from hell. He saves us to a wonderful inheritance. Amen. One that's imperishable, one that's undefiled, one that's unfading. So if God has awakened your soul this morning, rejoice. Man, when you leave this room, you got a lot to be grateful for. Number three, all souls do live forever. Whether you believe it or not, it's truth. Verse 37 says, but that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush where he calls the Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. I love what Jesus does here with these Sadducees. Do you see it? Sadducees believe in the Old Testament. They, they, they believe in the first five books of the Bible. They believe in Moses' books. And so Jesus says, Jesus is over here. He says, oh, you want to go to the Old Testament? I'll go there. I'll go to the Old Testament. How about the burning bush? We all know the story of the burning bush, right? God speaks to Moses through a bush that is burning but is never consumed. He goes, how about if we go there and talk about the resurrection? And he says this, at the burning bush, God says, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Get this in the language. It's all present tense, not past tense. They're all dead. Physically, they no longer walk the planet. So, so Jesus says this, you want to play that game? I'll show you the resurrection at the burning bush. 
When God says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, present tense, he doesn't say, I was their God. He says, I am their God. Because he knows all souls live forever. So even in that moment, he's playing the game with their own rules and says, you know what? I still am their God, even though they don't walk the planet, just like I'll be the God of every other true believer after they're dead and gone. Look at John 5, 28 through 29. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Now, I don't pull that passage out to intimidate, to use as a scare tactic. I will say this. It's the reality and it's an eternal spec perspective of who God is. See, it's a reminder that we're all going to live forever. Some will live to God's glory. Some will live in eternal judgment. So let me say this. If you're sitting in this room today and you don't know which camp you fall in, don't leave this place until you do business with God. Because it's the most important business you'll ever do. So whether that's talk to me, whether that's grab one of our elders, whether that's grab anybody to have a conversation, to pray a prayer, to work through what it really means to be a Christ follower, man, that's what we're here for. Not here to play church. We're not here to check something off the box because God smiles at our church attendance. Spoiler alert, he doesn't. We're here to do business with God. We're here to recognize the glory of God. We're here to worship a holy, righteous, perfect God. And if he has saved you, man, fall on your knees and be grateful. Thank him. Because you, just like me, I deserve hell. I deserve death. I, I, I deserve destruction. But because of his love and his grace and his mercy, for whatever reason, he chose to save me. And he chose to save you too. Lastly, number four, our God is God of the living, not a God of the dead. This isn't a live church. We're a live church because we have live individuals who have put their trust in Jesus Christ. And God is not a God of the dead. He's of the living. Look at verses 38 through 40. We'll end right here. Now he is, he is not a God of the dead, but of the living for all live to him. And then some of these scribes in Scribes answered, teacher, you have spoken well, for they no longer dared to ask him a question. In other words, Jesus puts them in their place. He quiets their spirit, quiets their mind. They move away. But understand this, one final point. God is an eternal God, and he's a living God, and he is for the living. You and I will live forever. For those of us that are called into his glory, we get to glorify and worship him forever. He truly is a God of the living, whether we're on this earth or not, our relationship with him goes on and on. So as the worship team comes out, and we're going to close with one song, as they do, I just want us together to look at Ephesians 2, and just let this fill your heart this morning. Here it is. But God, being rich in his mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, dead in our sin, dead doing our own thing, living our own life, whether you're a nun and you don't believe anything or you're walking around with your basket of potpourri, God in our transgressions made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Stand with me as we close. God, thank you for the power of your word. Thank you for the power of the resurrection that God, you sent your son Jesus not only to prove that you are the God of the living, even though this earth tried to kill Jesus, he arose on that third day to show the world that he has conquered Satan, death, sin, and hell for all of eternity. For so, so for those of us in this room that are filled with the Holy Spirit because you have saved us, we have nothing but gratitude. So we worship you and honor you this day. God, for those in the room that do not know you, I pray that you will draw them to yourself. That they would enter into real conversation, that they would engage in what Christianity really is with someone that they know here. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we live in a day and age, in a country, in a place where we can come, open up your word, and be encouraged by it. 
So God, we love you today. We worship you in spirit and in truth. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let's sing. Thank you, thank you, thank you for engaging with God's word today. My prayer, my hope is that uh, you leave this place transformed um, by his power, not by anything that has happened here. A um, couple quick announcements as you walk out. Wednesday night is one thing. Uh, if you haven't experienced it, you're not alone, neither have I. <laughs> Uh, come out Wednesday. Uh, it's a wonderful night of prayer. A meal starts at 545, and then the prayer time starts at uh, 630. It'll be my first time. I'm excited to be here. Join us Wednesday night. Also, Biblical Counseling Conference just ended last last night, and uh, we are already planning for another one uh, next fall. But if you want to partake in that, if you sign up now in the next month, you'll get a discount. Get a $100 discount. I think it's a $99 discount. So if you want to be part of either Track 1, Track 2, of that. Sign up now. It'll help uh, save you money for next year. And then lastly, uh, our community fund, we're still moving towards our goal of 125. Uh, we're 57% of the way there. So please give to that so that we can continue to reach our community. And I don't, they didn't put this one on my uh, paper, but I have to announce that next Saturday is a flag football game. So uh, maybe they thought I was too old for that, so they didn't give me the announcement. But go, go on our website, get the details of that, and uh, I may, uh, I may loosen up the arm and uh, get her going uh, next uh, next Sunday. So that's next Sunday, flag football. Um, God bless you. Thanks for being a part of this church. This is a wonderful place. You're a wonderful family. This is home. God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.